Hello everyone, this is Professor Hasselman, History 104 Online, and today we're going to be talking about uh, the birth of the Catholic Church and the emergence of uh, Christian culture in late antiquity. That's what we're going to be talking about today. So we saw in an earlier lecture that the Christian Church was spreading in the Roman Empire, that it was creating an organizational structure, and its members had some sense of belonging to a community larger than their own local church. Now, we must turn to the emergence of an empire-wide church that can be called Catholic in three senses, institutionally, legally, and doctrinally. First, then, we address the institution. So the key question is, how did the primitive Christian communities grow into the Roman Catholic Church? There are, as always, hints in language. Um, ecclesia and Kyriakon. Bishops gradually became important personages in towns throughout the empire, and they commanded respect, wore distinctive clothing, controlled important forms of patronage, and provided an outlet for talents. Institutionally, the key step was the emergence of the bishops of Rome, or the popes, originally a term of endearment, to a position of leadership. Um, apostolic succession applied everywhere to the legitimacy of the local clergy, and Rome was doubly apostolic, with Peter and Paul. Now, from the 3rd century, Rome placed a great stress on the uh, Petrine text in Matthew, uh, chapter 16, verses 16 through 19, to assert that just as Peter had been the leader of the apostles, so too were Peter's successors leaders of the whole church. Now, in reality, the historical associations of Rome itself were important, although the Roman church did not emphasize this. In the midst of great theological battles, and we'll speak of these later, people frequently uh, turned to Rome for advice or even decisions, and this slowly turned into a precedent. The emperor Theodosius commanded all people in the empire to believe as the bishop of Rome believed. Now, Pope Leo I, who lived or ruled from 440 to 461, was the great um, theoretician of papal leadership. Pope Gregory I, who ruled from 1590 to 604, in the absence of an imperial government of Rome, took over much responsibility for the food supply, urban amenities, and even defense against the Lombards. Now, he was a quasi-ruler in the old imperial capital. But there were quarrels over uh, monarchical versus collegial models of church government. In late antiquity, the popes generally lacked the power to impose their will. So monarchical, meaning uh, having a king, kingship with a hierarchy, versus collegial, meaning ruling as a group, as a college of uh, bishops and cardinals. Now, ironically, the very Roman state before whose officials Jesus was tried eventually became a major supporter of the Christian faith and the Catholic Church. Christians encountered the Roman state sporadically for a long time. Nero made them scapegoats in Rome, Domitian outlawed Christianity, Pliny wrote to Trajan to ask what to do about Christians, uh, provincial officials occasionally moved against individuals or communities, but usually in circumstances about which uh, we are Ill, excuse me, ill-informed. Between the years of 250 and 251, <clears throat> Emperor Decius uh, undertook the first systematic persecution of Christians. Diocletian undertook the Great Persecution from 303 to 306, and this was part of his ideological realignment. <clears throat> He attacked clergy and assemblies, gathered and burned books, required people to appear in temples to make an act of sacrifice, and encouraged uh, denunciations, or, den or denouncing the faith. Diocletian's efforts failed, and Constantine began the close association between the emperors and the church. Now, his mother was a devout Catholic, and he seems to have converted very late in his life. In 313, in the Edict of Milan, Constantine granted Christianity legal toleration in the empire. He granted tax exemptions and fiscal privileges to the church and made massive personal donations, not least the Lateran Basilica in Rome. He also saw to the building of St. Peter's and St. Paul's Basilicas in Rome. Now, for a brief time, Emperor Julian, the apostate, uh, attempted a pagan revival, but he failed. 
Between 378 and 380, Theodosius passed laws effectively making Roman Christianity the state religion of the empire. And Pope Galatius, who from 492 to 496, wrote a famous letter to Emperor Anastasius in which he explained that the world was governed by the authority of priests and the power of kings. And this was to elevate the religious hierarchy over the secular, a remarkable transformation. Now, the record of imperial relations with the church is mixed. Uh, it's one involving both benevolence and ruthless interference. Now, we must remember that Roman officials had always seen their duties, at least to some degree, in religious terms. And emperors were the state's chief religious authorities. There was no concept of the separation of church and state. Now, Catholicism is a matter of belief involved, uh, and involved the development of a canon of scripture and the elaboration of a creed or a basic statement of faith. From the early 2nd century, it became clear that the scriptures were central to the authentic teaching of the emerging church. But what scriptures? Palestinian rabbis established the um, Masoretic, that is, the traditional text of the Hebrew scriptures. But this posed two problems for Christians. One, should they use the Hebrew Bible at all? And what use, if any, should they make of the Greek text of the Hebrew Bible, or the Septuagint? Eventually, it was decided that the Old Testament would be retained, but there were disagreements in antiquity, which persist today, on the authority of the seven books that appear in the Septuagint, and not Hebrew. Now, by the 5th century, a canon of New Testament writings had become definitive. A substantial amount of post-biblical material was thus left out. The earliest versions of the New Testament were in Greek. An old Latin version began to circulate too, as well as other Latin versions. And in 382, Pope uh, Damasus commissioned St. Jerome uh, to prepare a new Latin translation. And he spent the rest of his life working on the Vulgate, or the Vulgata. Now, once Christianity could function publicly, some serious differences in teachings began to appear. The differences turned uh, around two basic elements of Christian doctrine, that God was triune, or three persons and one God, and that Jesus was true God and true man. In an attempt to preserve strict monotheism, Arius, a priest of Alexandria, taught that Jesus was slightly subordinate to God, the Father. Now, fierce controversies drove Constantine to call the Council of Nicaea in 325. Now, Arius was condemned, and the Nicene Creed, which is still recited in many churches in a version revised at the Council of Constantinople in 381, spelled out Trinitarian theology. Now, Arianism did not die immediately, however. Some of Constantine's successors were Arians, and many of the barbarians who were converted to Arian Christianity. In the late 4th and 5th centuries, the great controversy turned around the divine and human natures of Jesus Christ. And at the Council of um, Chalcedon in 451, the teaching that Jesus was fully God and fully man was defined and affirmed. Now, some um, monophysite, or literally one-naturite, Christians persisted in their beliefs, especially in the eastern provinces. Now, by the end of the 5th century, then, Christianity had an empire-wide organization, at least nominally under Rome's authority. A well-defined legal status in the empire, a definitive body of authoritarian writings, uh, and officially proclaimed definitions as some of its most important and difficult doctrines. Now, all in all, that's a remarkable achievement in a relatively short period of time. Now, for a long time, of course, Christians had been illegal, and they weren't going to draw attention to themselves by battling out in public. And now, once those problems began to become public, a group of thinkers began addressing themselves to those problems and to much else besides, as we'll see as we go along. Now, our final look at the world of late antiquity will involve asking how and where we can see the impact of Christianity on the culture of the Roman world. Now, three main areas of inquiry will hold our attention. Under what circumstances did Christianity go from struggling for intellectual respectability to becoming intellectually dominant? Two, if many Christians made their peace with classical culture in the Roman world, 
what are we to make of the monks or those who opted out? And three, if by the end of late antiquity the vast majority of people were Christians, how did this affect their daily lives? Now, the intellectual culture of Christianity is inextricably bound up with the church fathers, the figures who dominated cultural life in the patristic, from pater or father, the patristic era. Already in the second and third centuries, Christian writers had addressed important questions. How did Christianity differ from Judaism and from pagan philosophy? How could one live as a Christian in a pagan world? And some pagan writers had also begun to take Christianity seriously enough that they critiqued some of its teachings. Now, once Christianity became legal, the patristic era dawned and lasted until about 600 in the West and 750 in the East. The greatest work was done in the period from 350 to 450. This was also the time when Christian art and architecture began to emerge. The Church Fathers addressed three big sets of questions. How is the Bible to be understood? How are fundamental Christian doctrines to be explained? And how does Christianity relate to classical culture? In other words, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem, as one of them asked. Now this was the third great age of Latin literature and there were Greek fathers too. The first great Latin father was Ambrose, a local nobleman who was elected Bishop of Milan. His greatest contribution was to translate Greek philosophical ideas and the writings of Greek Christian writers, such as Origen of Alexandria, into intelligible forms for Latins. He also developed and propagated the use of allegory in the Latin West as a key mode of biblical interpretation. Now, Jerome we met previously as the translator of the Vulgate. Now, he too was a blue blood attracted to the church. He wrote numerous letters to explain Christian teachings, and he played a key role in opening up Christian doctrine for small groups of high-born Roman women. His writings were much prized in the Renaissance for their elegance. Now, the greatest of the Latin fathers was Augustine. He was born in North Africa to a middling sort of family, and his mother, Monica, was a devout Catholic. He studied in local schools and became a teacher of rhetoric before moving to Rome, then to Milan, where he fell under the influence of Ambrose. Augustine was not a systematic thinker. He addressed problems as they came up, and in the course of his long life, he spoke to many problems of Christian theology. His confessions chronicled his conversion and stands as the first work of true introspection in Western literature. Now, Augustine's On Christian Doctrine was the first systematic exposition of how Christianity related to classical learning. His City of God was a magnificent theology of history occasioned by the Gothic sack of Rome. His aim was to show that in the grand scheme of things, Rome did not matter much. And this was a decisive break with the classical idea that the world would last exactly as long as Rome itself. Now the last of the Latin fathers was Pope Gregory I, who wrote biblical commentaries, letters, lives of saints, and the pastoral rule, a book in the classical tradition that, exp that ex explained the responsibilities of bishops. It was influential for centuries in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, and there were, were there were fathers as well. Now, the Cappadocian fathers, Basil the Great, his brother Gregory of Nyssa, and Gregory of um, Nazianzus, were formidable biblical scholars and spiritual writers, but most important for their participation in the Trinitarian and Christological um, uh, struggles of the age. John um, Chrysostom, who, the golden-throated, was Patriarch of Constantinople and a preacher of great skill and power. And above all, he charted the Christian moral life, going so far as to criticize the imperial court for immorality and settling or setting a bad example. Now, in this age of great intellectual achievements, when the church gained power and status in society, there were those who opted out, who turned their backs on the civic society of antiquity. These were the monks. There had always been an ascetic tradition in Judaism, early Christianity, and most religious traditions. 
There were people who believed that by rigorous self-denial and discipline, it might be possible to gain virtual union with God. Now sometimes these were solitaries, and sometimes they lived in community. Christian monasticism rose in 4th century Egypt. Anthony was a solitary and established uh, the, the Eremitic ideal, uh, from Eremos meaning desert. Um, Pacomius began as a solitary, then created the first communities, men and later women, living the uh, Cenobitic life. Um, for the word Cenobitic comes from koinos bios, meaning the common life. Monks are therefore uh, manakoi, or lone ones, who live in a monasterion, a, a monastery. Now, especially after Pacomius, they follow a rule, or regula, and are called regulars. Now from Egypt, uh, monasticism spread for several reasons. Um, a life of Saint Antony uh, that became a later antique bestseller. Collections of wise sayings and teachings of the Desert Fathers were also popular. And then popularization of Jerome's writings and people who traveled to Egypt to sit at the feet of great religious masters. These are all ways that monasticism spread out of Egypt. Now, Aramitic monasticism spread in the Eastern Mediterranean through the work of Saint Basil, uh, whose rule was normative for centuries. Aramitic monasticism originally got a foothold in Gaul through Saint Martin at Tours and Saint uh, Honoratus at Lerin. Now this form spread in Ireland through the work of Saint Patrick. In the West, the future belonged to Saint Benedict of Nursia. He came from a modest Roman family, then abandoned secular studies to pursue a life of Christian retreat and virtue. Now eventually, a community gathered at Monte Cassino where in about 540, he wrote what had become the most famous and widely adopted rule in all of monastic history. Benedict composed his rule for his own monastery, but Pope Gregory I first admired it and popularized it, and Benedict with a biography. Benedict's rule was particularly prized in early England, and English monasteries promoted it on the continent. Anglo-Saxons influenced the Franks, whose greatest King Charlemagne imposed the Benedictine rule on all monasteries. Okay, so how did Christianity affect culture and life? We talked about the, the spread of Christianity and the development of monasteries in the East and West. Now, Christians continued to use Latin and Greek and thus assured the preservation of those languages while enriching them with new vocabulary and conceptual frameworks. One should not press too hard the famous thesis of Adolf von Harnack, that classical culture captured Christianity. Christians knew how to spoil the Egyptians. Christian patronage put an end to the building bust of the third century world and created a new dy and dynamic architecture. Christian art spread widely and found creative ways to reinterpret classical motifs and styles while adding new ones. Christian poets carried on the classical tradition, and by assigning power to celibate men, Christianity created a new kind of society that also was a democracy of sin. Christian martyrs and saints created a new kind of hero figure, and a new morality assured women a more secure place in society. Slowly but surely, Christian ethics pervaded secular law. Now, in the lands that had been the western provinces of the Roman Empire, we see that power had come to be shared between Germanic warrior elites and urban bishops. The rich were still, as for centuries, landowners, and much of the cultural landscape still looked classical. But in fact, the dominant cultural orientation had become Christian. Europe's Middle Ages were dawning, although no one really recognized this at the time. So this is the end of today's lecture on the, the, the rise and birth of the Catholic Church and the development of Christian culture. Um, next week, we're going to be looking east and talking about the development of Islam and its prophet Muhammad. And then we're going to also be looking at the Byzantine Empire uh, that was also east. And these, these will be two short little lectures uh, discussing what was going on in the east.
So I hope you enjoyed today's lecture. Um, this is the end of today's lecture on the Catholic Church, the beginning of the Catholic Church. Uh, have a great weekend, everyone, and uh, I look forward to uh, teaching you more next week on Islam and then the, the rise of the West even further. Thank you.